you know, there's a place called the Mohawk in Buffalo, New York. Like there's a place called the Grog Shop in Cleveland, Ohio. You know, you, like a lot of towns have a version of that, you know, what right, that right. dingy club that's held up by stickers. You know, you feel like if you took the <laughs> stickers off the wall, it would all yeah. fall down, you know. Yeah. Hey, William, how's it going? How's it going, Adam? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear you can hear me. I, I take it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was laughing about, I don't know if I'm too loud or too soft or what, but um, I was laughing about how we all became experts at the zoom thing during the pandemic. A hundred percent. We all kind of were forced to like um, become tech experts and stuff. Those yeah, of us like, that weren't used to doing stuff like that. And now sure. I haven't done it in a while. So I, I, had, I had to kind of reacquaint myself. So I'm okay. hoping everything's working. Oh, it looks great. Sounds great. Yeah, I know. Um, I actually had the benefit, not benefit, I guess, but my wife uh, has always kind of worked from home, working for different colleges in California. Um, so she was pretty good at Zoom. Like they use it quite a bit before, you know, all those other companies started to like Google meet and all that stuff started to, to, to come around. So she knew Zoom kind of well from like before this started, but uh, yeah, and early in the pandemic, we used to do all these interviews in person, uh, and then it was like this way. And in the very, very beginning, I was trying to figure out how to like record phone calls in not into Zoom, but just like in general. And then uh, everyone became like adapted to Zoom, and it was like, okay, this has made it a lot easier. And now it's almost <laughs> like I s still continue with Zoom because we can. I can interview people like you across the country. So yeah. Well, so, so you're, I see you have a San Diego hat. Are you from I'm, Southern California? Yeah. I'm originally from San Diego, lived there pretty much my whole life, except for I spent about five years in San Francisco and now I live in Nashville, Tennessee though. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It made me think of, I used to play at a place called the Casbah. Oh man. I love the, the Casbah. Good friend yeah, of I, mine I, uh, books that venue. Yeah. Is it still around? Oh Yeah. Oh, it's, cool. It's, it made it through the pandemic, surprisingly. Well, not not everything did, you know? So, yeah, I yeah. really like that place. I really like getting to California in general, but I also really like getting to Nashville. So that's really cool. You're there. That's a good, that, Nashville always feels like a small town Yeah, to me in certain ways when I'm there. And I always really like it. And so, uh, but yeah, I'm coming to you from uh, Lee County, Iowa, which is the... I always have to kind of tell people it's the southeastern part of the state uh, okay. by the Mississippi River. So it's, um, yeah, that southeastern part of Iowa. And it's a place no one really thinks of. And so I always have to kind of give a geographic little pinpoint on where it's at. But I live by the Mississippi River. So, That's you know, St. Awesome. Lu St. Louis is like three hour drive south and Chicago is like a three hour drive east and so on. That's but, uh, nice. Yeah, yeah, no, it's great for touring, you know, but like growing up, I, I live on a farm here. I live, I, my wife and daughter and I live on the same farm that I grew up on, actually. No and way. So, it's amazing. Yeah. So life led me all sorts of places, but then I kind of ended up right back here, which is where I love. And uh, that's just kind of how life worked out. But yeah, growing up, I mean, I live in the woods. I live in the middle of nowhere, pretty much like and so I really like it, but growing up, it was always, uh, you know, it was a little, little isolated, uh, mm -hmm. besides school and stuff. You'd see people at school and, and everything, but, but music was always a way to kind of feel connected to other people and other things and other cultures mm -hmm. and stuff. So yeah, music was always, always important growing up. Like my folks love country music. And so they, they played a lot of that um, growing up. So yeah, the, the Nashville connection there made me kind of think of that. But so yeah, um, we yeah. live on the outskirts, like a, a little more rural area, not too too bad. But we're we're about forty minutes south of Nashville. Uh, it's kind of perfect. It's, yeah, it's nice. So you know you can you can we have more space, and it's not really small towny, but it kind of is. You know, everybody kind of knows each other in the neighborhood and and around the area. Uh, but we can still drive out to Nashville and there's some bigger areas kind of fairly like 20 minutes away, which is nice. I wish I had a bigger, bigger spot, uh, place, you know, bigger land plot. When we moved here, 
my wife was like, oh, and she wanted to get a, you know, acres of land. And I'm like, I was kind of <laughs> nervous. I'm like, well, we, we're coming from San Diego where it's all pretty, you know, compact. But now that I've right. been here, I'm like, ah, I wish we would have done that. Got the bigger <laughs> land, you know what I mean? Um, but well, we love it. it. Maybe love it won't it. be the it won't it won't be the last place you land. Maybe maybe though maybe there's some acreage in the future there. I'm hoping so. I mean, I would love to live <laughs> kind of like an unisolated area, like you're talking about. Uh, I have two boys. One of them's seven, and just like if if we had enough space where he could just run outside and be in the woods like all day like he would he would do it so i wish yep. i had a little bit more space yep yeah my my daughter's three or almost four and like yesterday it snowed here and oh, so wow. her and my wife now yeah it was kind of that first snow with winter kind of Cool. And a teacher about like we were listening to like Roberta Flack. Oh, cool! You know, I, I wanted to hear these like badass female voices. I mean, everything. Sure. I mean, every kind of voices. But she's into singing already, kind of. Wow. Vo vocal, or, you know, singing in in quotes, uh, vocalizing, singing along and stuff. But yeah. We listened to like the Beatles and Roberta Flack and and all sorts of different things, and so. I love that. that That's so cool. Yeah. Because that, 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 that was important to me growing up. I mean, my folks would play like my mom's favorite was Willie Nelson. Oh, that my mom loves Willie favorite. Nelson also. Like yeah, he, she's I mean, like, he's... I'm playing Willie. You better play Willie Nelson at my funeral. I was like, yikes, <laughs> that's a little dark. But yeah, jeez, well, that's you know a long time from now, mom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a old. long time. But yeah, that that was you know one of her favorites. But like, um, and so yeah, Willie kind of spans all like Dolly Parton or something that mm. kind of span, like everyone can agree on Willie and, and Dolly right, and right. these certain things. So, so that was her favorite. So we had a steady diet of that growing up That's and cool. I just loved uh, his weird style. I was like, this doesn't sound like any other country. I didn't, I couldn't even articulate why, but I was like, this doesn't sound like anybody else. Mm -hmm. Which of course now I know like he got flack for early on. Like he didn't sing like anyone else was, his chords were too jazzy for everyone else, but he right. carved That's his own That's what makes way. him him, right? You know, yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah. And then, so my and my folks also loved um, one. Of, I think their first date was a Charlie Pride concert. Uh, oh, he wow. played the County Fair, <laughs> and um, they went and saw Charlie Pride. So that was one of their favorites. A, a ton of Charlie Pride growing up, and so when it was time, I, I always liked singing, uh huh, and just making up little ditties and writing little stories and. Stuff. And so when I finally learned a few chords on the guitar, um, I was able to kind of like put the two together a little bit. And um, yeah, my dad played guitar, my mom played piano, and and um uh they would they would have said not very well, but um they're, they're passed on now, but they they would have said not very well, but but music was around, you know. And, mm -hmm. and so my dad had a Sears and Roebuck acoustic guitar. Oh. Wow. And that was my first. Yeah. I, I still have it like a junky old guitar. That's I awesome. Some, I love that. It, I love hearing that people save that first guitar. That's so cool. Yeah. Oh, and I'm sentimental. I'm, 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 I'm really sentimental and I don't throw nothing away. And so, <laughs> so uh, I'm, so I'm like that too. Man. Unless it stinks. <laughs> unless right, it right. stinks, then I throw it away. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, so I, yeah. So he had that. And I remember learning, I had a little chord book, Mel Bay, Mel Bay. Mel Bay guitar. There used to be this series of guitar books and instrument books by this dude, Mel Bay, mm -hmm. and you could learn chords. And, and it, it took me a long time to get the hang of it, but um, yeah. So I, you finally realize like, Oh, all these, all these songs are just a few chords and I can mm -hmm. maybe kind of do this. And, and so, yeah, it kind of, kind of went on from there, but I want to impart that onto my, my daughter too. I've got a drum set out here in my little home studio. 
Oh, rad. She, My... she kind of messes around on a little tiny acoustic guitar, but she really likes to get behind them drums and uh-huh. I tell her, oh, you don't play guitar. There's a million of us schmucks. That's what I did to my son. And <laughs> play that drums or crazy. bass. <laughs> yeah, I gave him a dream. You'll always have a gig. Tr- we bought him a one of the electric kits at the time. Like when he was probably three. Yeah, when COVID happened, when it started. And we bought him an electric kit because at the time we lived in a townhome. So I didn't want to drive the neighbors insane. So we got him an electric kit. And I called a buddy of mine who's a pretty good drum i mean he's a really good drummer but he's done some things and i'm like dude what do i get him and he's like you get you he sent me one he's like you need to get this one that has the real kick he's like don't get the trigger kick Ah. get the real kick and everything else is you know whatever and he loves it he loves it and i'm so happy i did and it was like i don't want him to get into good i want him to learn guitar at his own pace (laughs) but it's like learn learn everything yeah Yeah. if he can drum like you said he can (laughs) You're the you can get the pick of the litter when it comes to bands, right? <laughs> yeah, the, the all too rare drummer. Like growing up, yeah, when it was time to start like playing with other people, you know, yeah, there's everyone wants to play guitar and that's fine, but um, you know, you knew like twenty guitar players for every one drummer, you know, basically. Right. And, and then I got and so yeah, so tell him yeah, he'll always have a always have a gig. And there's just something about the rhythm, like even now. I play a kick drum on stage and a banjo Mm -hmm. and, and a guitar sometimes, but the drum is like my favorite. I just kick a drum, but that's my favorite thing. Like like, I'm a wannabe drummer, but that rhythm (laughs) is, is everything to me. I mean, the rhythm, once you find that rhythm, you know, you you can start making up songs and, and whatever, find some melodies and stuff. But, but that's cool that you, you had some inside knowledge from your buddy that was like, yeah, here's the, here's the thing to get, man. Like I could play guitar and I was in bad day. I knew I would never make it as a musician. I loved music and I got into radio because I'm like, okay, I can be around it. Uh, but I'm not obviously a player or a songwriter or anything like I was admire those people. wish I could do that. But I, I, I just love music. So I was like, how do I get into this? And a friend of mine's dad was on a radio station in San Diego and he kind of helped me. And then I did that and got a job in the Bay area for a bit and came back to San Diego and, well, now I do this, but it was, just, awesome. I tried to be around it, you know, and, and I couldn't figure out another way to do it. And this was my only in, uh, but well, I knew there's... the drummer was hard as hell. You find <laughs> one guy that could play and then he would like not, if you didn't have the song or you weren't doing what he wanted to do, he'd just be like, oh yeah, like, I'm busy. You're like, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they kind of have all the power, you know, they do. and and a lot of the responsibility lugging all that stuff around, you know, <laughs> right, so, right. So, got to have a truck or a bigger car. Yeah, that's that's awesome. And, and um, yeah, and so that's why I really love the banjo, too. Like, so I, I started on a, a little acoustic guitar and then my both my grandpas played banjo. Wow. And and um, so I got, you know, those were around and it was just kind of around. And I got into that like as an early teenager. And I thought, oh, this 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 is what I love. Like this is I still love guitar, too. But mm-hmm the banjo is kind of like what I love. Cause it's a drum. It's a drum and a string instrument, you know? Yeah. The way I play it, especially it's, it's mostly like a drum with strings. And so I really love that. And I could never do the like, um, uh, super blue grassy Ralph Stanley fancy stuff on it. I still can't. And, and, but it, I'm, I learned if I could like play it as a rhythm instrument, um, that's, that was what I like to do. So, um, yeah, so I started yeah, playing the banjo and writing little songs on that, like even as a teenager, like starting to make up things. And and yeah, you just you just start to just get a feel for that stuff. And I'm sure you've talked to so many people on here. A lot. Uh, yeah, yeah. banjo is a, a, a big a, one, though. Not a lot of people talk about playing banjo, you know? Yeah. I mean, I've had, so, I've had a lot of bluegrass people and, and that do, but it's like not as many as, you know, not a whole lot of people go, yeah, yeah, I learned a banjo and, as a teenager. It's just like yeah. not the go-to, really. <laughs> and I, I just, I just fell in love with it, and 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 by that time, I, I talk about this a lot because it it was so formative, like, like the different music that you hear throughout your life, but especially that stuff you start to discover on your own. There's mm-hmm. the there's the stuff you you heard from your folks that that was like a base layer that you grew up with. For me, it was country music, um, and so that's just in there. That's like a base layer that's in there. But then 
you start to rebel against that a little bit. You become a sure. teenager and you start <laughs> to be like, okay, wh- who are the misfits? Like who's Fugazi? Like right. I always talk about it, but I, I, I would get this magazine called Thrasher magazine. Oh yeah. The you skateboarding know, magazine. Of the Bay Area. Oh yeah. man, dude. And, okay. And, yeah. I, I was a skater kid growing up. Me, me too. And I still love it. Like I can't Same do the here. things I could do, but I, I will cruise. I will skate all day. Oh, long. there's I, a skate park it. by my house. And I got my, my older son into skateboarding. And I'm like, right. When he was like, Oh yeah, I'm interested. I'm like building him fun boxes and like, a little <laughs> <bad>. <laughs> we're going to the oh, skate the park. Best. Oh, I'm well, way I too, just I talking can't about hurt that. myself, but I'm just, Oh yeah. I love skateboarding. Yeah. Bay area the thrashers out of San Francisco. Yeah. RIP Jake Phelps, you know? Oh man. And, yeah. But um, so, so like you could get that at the grocery store, the local little grocery store. So got in, got into skating in my, my little small town. Like there's not a ton of pavement, but you could, you could kind of skate and <laughs> country, country style skating, you know, and using sure. curbs and stuff. We build little ramps, but the, but that magazine's influence can't be overstated. Like I would pour through and just read, you know, not just the skating, but all the music. Mm-hmm. I mean, it just, that was like such a window into a world. You like, you read the the notes from the underground and be like, okay, bad brains. I got to check that out. What's that? Okay. Minor threat. Mm-hmm. Okay. That dude now has a band called Fugazi. Okay. Got to check that out. You know, you just like yeah. go down the line. And I was just like, that was my baseball cards. Like that was my, I was just a nerd about like pouring through and, and, and getting that stuff. So I then, yeah, that. that did that you get skate videos and stuff? Yeah, I mean, we're like, see, for me, it was like the, the magazines I loved them. I'd just go through and be like, oh, you know, so and so is a, I'd rip them out and, you know, tape them to my wall and stuff. But like the videos, you'd watch a video part from, you know, a four and one or like, you know, an early toy machine video. And I'd be like, who is this? And I'm like, yeah. oh, this is, you know, London Dungeon by the Misfits. And I would buy the album just for the one yeah. song. And then the whole thing is, you know, insanely awesome but it was like that's how i discovered like iron maiden because my parents weren't into like heavier stuff it was more like yeah the beatles and i guess like the zeppelin and stuff like that but nothing like you know that far over and that's how i discovered bands like that and and then they're your own forever like right that's sort of like that it's like oh that's mine from now on i'm gonna put that in my pocket forever and i still love all that stuff because yeah, those formidable years, man, you, you get that shit. And it was, it wasn't your folks. It's like, this is mine, you know? Right. And so right. that, that it'll always be important, but those, those skate videos, you're absolutely right. Uh, obviously pre-internet way pre-internet uh-huh. uh, being a common thing. Like, yeah, there was a video called ban this. There was, I'm, I'm oh, yeah. 45. So my, my time was like late eighties, early nineties. Like you'd get the video, the VHS copy of like uh-huh. Hocus, po- Hocus Pocus by H street was a big oh, one. Sure. Um, search for animal chin, like all, all this stuff. And then, and then a, a million great ones since then, but um, yeah, the toy early toy machine ones were rad. Like, so you, you, you get that, get those influences, you know? So I was like early on, I want to do this cunt. I, I, this country thing and folk thing but like kind of through this punk lens where i kind of you know with, with a little bit of an aggressive style or maybe a um i don't know it was a little sloppy too and i was like okay i heard the ramones so that's okay and yeah um, what you're doing is so unique it's like the the faster acoustic guitar and like the raspier punk rock kind of vocals but it's not all like that but i mean i was watching the, your new music video and you i've heard i hear that you know, i've listened to your albums and obviously the band is there and i've seen live videos and stuff but the new the new video you just released is just you in a hallway with an acoustic guitar yeah uh, yeah and, and, and I, yeah I still still love the guitar too and yeah th- i'm glad i'm glad you checked it out I, we we kind of run and gone that one while we were um recording another video that's at an upstairs of a venue in Iowa city called Gabe's. Mm-hmm. And that was a, like a punk rock was and is like a punk rock venue. I mean, I saw some of my first great shows there. That's in a, a town called Iowa city, mm-hmm. which is like 90 miles North of where I live. So oh, wow. growing up, that was the nearest town. The, the university is there. So it was, you know, college town. You, you could meet different kind of folks, like folks of all different stripes and colors and, and it was such a cool thing growing up to to visit. It felt like the big city, but there there's a, a few great music venues there. It's right on Interstate 80. 
So a traveling band would often hit Iowa City between like Omaha and Chicago or Minneapolis and St. Louis or whatever. Mm -hmm. Iowa City is kind of this central thing. So you'd get like Mike Watt, Mike Watt would come there and like, I mean, Nirvana played at this place, Gabe's way back in the day and and a ton, ton of other great things. So that that venue was always important to me. So when uh, we were making videos for this new album, uh, out January 26th, by the way. Yes. Uh, <laughs> shameless plug. No, uh, we'll plug uh, it all any, day. No, I'll we'll talk get, to you about the whole new album. No, we'll but. get yeah, we'll get into that too. But um, so I, I was like, oh, and we'll make a couple of videos in the upstairs of Gabe's, which is it's where I met the woman that's now my wife. It's wow. where like we just spent millions of hours in this place. It was our kind of home away from home, this dingy punk rock venue. And so that's where that video is it's like in the, one of the back hallways and um yeah i thought it, it was befitting kind of a, a yeah like kind of a folk punk song like that is and and so yeah i always just gravitated toward that and i've got quieter slow songs yeah. too that i like to, to that play too cool but... like it right out i was like wow and it's interesting because you brought up the casbah earlier the, the the first thing i thought of when you were when i watched the video i was like oh this kind of looks like the casbah a little bit oh it's very similar vibe <laughs> this yeah, place like... gabe's yeah the casbah like you know there's a place called the mohawk in buffalo new york like there's a place called the grog shop in cleveland ohio you know you, like a lot of towns have a version of that you know what right, that right. dingy club that's held up by stickers you know you feel like if you took the stickers <laughs> off the wall it would all yeah. fall down you know yeah, the whole the, bathroom's covered in them and yeah <laughs> yeah but ca the casbah man i haven't been there in a long time but um that i always like that but yeah it's, it's that vibe and so uh i just yeah gravitated toward that it's awesome and, and then did yeah you... oh, sorry go ahead I oh oh off. i i mean i I could just yammer and yammer. So forgive me. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, that's what, that's what well, I love about podcasts. I mean, coming from radio, I'd have, you know, you get two minutes if that, and they'd cut it down to 45 seconds. And that was your interview. <laughs> so, so yeah. So like, so in Iowa city, uh, when I, when I turned 18, I, I moved there. Oh, okay. And, uh, were you in I a just, band at that time or were you playing with people around your town? Yeah, uh, not a band, but um, I played um, with my cousin. My cousin and I sort of started playing um, guitar around the same time, which was awesome because we would kind of stoke each other up to like mm -hmm. learn chords and learn songs. And so we would do like cover songs uh, um, around just like little DIY coffee shop slash. We used to play at this karate studio. There was like a karate dojo that some of our friends like took karate lessons at. And we would do that's shows there. That's so <laughs> interesting. Before I oh knew gosh. like what DIY was, I never even heard that term until later. It was like, oh, we were doing a DIY thing. And so, <laughs> so we were, we were doing that. And so I had a base of like how to perform or, you know, how to like get in front of a crowd and do it. Uh -huh. And then, um, yeah, I moved to Iowa city. I wanted to start a punk band. I had, a, we, I had a punk band with some buddies called lost cause. And we wanted to sound like minor threat pretty much. And, and, we, and we never, never, never got there. Never were <laughs> able to do that. It's a lot harder than it sounds. So. Right. <laughs> so, but it was just fun, like wailing away in the basement. So I was like, now I need to stick to just my country acoustic folk roots, man. I, I'll let the experts be in the punk bands. I'll let other people do that. And so I just kind of stuck to what I, you know, I was kind of honing the thing that, that is what I do. Mm -hmm. And, and met, you know, met a ton of people there and that are still my best friends today that still play on my records today. Like when I need a guitar or drums, or I still call these same guys from 25 years ago that I first met, you know, that's amazing. And I, I, I say this often, but I tell people like younger folks coming up, one of the first, one of the greatest things you can do is just meet people, meet cool people and like go to whatever venue, whatever town you live in now on the internet, it's even easier. You can find your community. A lot of, right. you know, a lot yeah, easier right if there you're looking online. for it, you can find, find your people, but like find your people. It's so important. And, and so that's how I start, started to like tour, you know, they, they were kind of already into the DIY thing. They were more of like a screamo. This was like in like 99, 2000. So they mm -hmm. were, it was like post-punk screamo. They were great. Sure. They were called the, the Vita Blue and they were already in in touch with that network of um, DIY basements, 
um, you know, uh, VFW halls across the nation, yeah, basements, yeah, yeah. house shows. Like there's this whole network you can do. And I was like, oh, I didn't know you could just do it without a booking agent. You can do it without a manager. You can do it on your own. Again, yeah, like, just I was just learning like venues oh. probably and just trying to get yep. a show anywhere. Yep. Yep. And so they would set up these tours. They were go getters and they would set up these tours and we became friends. And so I jumped in the van with them, with my banjo and would, would open up the show, like would play like three or four songs. And these were like punk rock, hardcore venues, you know, and, and yeah, was but that also, but also like living rooms and, but to, oh, I mean, to it, get it up, was. if you're playing a punk cut, you know, nowadays I feel like, well, music is so like the spectrum is so big when it comes to audiences. Now I feel like, I mean, you look at like a poster for a, uh, like a Coachella poster and it's just like from here to there. But I feel like, you know, in the early two thousands and late nineties, when I was going to shows as well, like it would be like the lineup was just all these bands that sounded similar. And then to get up there with yep. a banjo and just start playing something totally different. Was that something you're like, I don't know how the crowd's going to receive this, but whatever, we're going to go for it. it. It was a new experiment every night. It felt like, you know, okay. because you're, you're exactly right. It would, especially in that, at that level, you, you know, a band books a show in a town at a place. And then, so, and, and another band hears about it in that town and they say, Hey, can we jump on the show too? Sure. Another mm -hmm. band hears about it. Oh, cool. There's a show happening. We didn't have to book it. We can just jump on. Cool. Right. Yeah, you're on. Before you know it, there's six or seven bands. <laughs> I mean, it was super common to have like a band would play 15 minutes and, you know, and then another band would play 20 minutes. And it was really common. And, mm -hmm. and but it was cool. It was all community and it was all good. So then I, I was able to stick out and be unique by like, and then I would get up with a banjo and everyone would kind of get quiet. That's um, cool. And, 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 and pay attention. Cause it was, it was like a loving crowd, really. Like, uh huh even then people were ready to hear something different and it's kind of a palate cleanser. You could take out your earplugs, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, and, and hear something different. So it, I had an advantage in that way. Cause it just stuck out and people would go, Oh, and they'd stop talking and, and listen. And so that, that was the way I started touring and we, we burned up the road. We, we played everywhere in the United States. And then I went to Europe with them. Wow. Bef uh, before my first record came out. And, and yeah, did it over there. And so we really learned how to like, you know, you get your 10,000 hours, so to speak. Mm -hmm. and, and, and also like how to sleep on floors, how to just yeah. how to be on the road, and how, to yeah, be like totally. courteous, how to show up on time, how to be cool. And, and, you know, and then the people would say, Hey, that was cool. Come back next time. Like when you come back on a tour of your own, you can play here. And so then I would set up tours on my own like that. And this is before I even had a record or anything. So that, that, wow. that was kind of the start of it. Um, yeah. And then you put a record out. Uh, well, you got you got signed, right? But you had already what, put out two albums before signing. I, I had done some like burnt CDs and like okay. hell, I had I had tapes. I had like burnt CDs that I would either give away or sell for a dollar or whatever. And they had my email in them. I would like photocopy the CD covers and like oh, sure. give them away. And, and But then in like 2002, um, the band that I was with, they were called Vita Blue. They had to change mm -hmm. their name to 10 Grand. But, uh, oh, okay. They, they changed, they I know changed the their name. name. Yeah. 10 Grand. Yeah. They, they wouldn't have. Yeah. They, they, they were awesome, but they sort of like were before their, they were ahead of their time a little bit and okay. they were, they were amazing, but they, they got signed by, uh, uh, a label out of Chicago. We played in Chicago all the time uh, called Southern records. And they were also based in London. Um, London was the main base, but they had a, a headquarters in Chicago too. Some people came out to see them and sign them. And they saw me and liked me too. And they said, Hey, come by the office tomorrow morning before you uh, head out of town. <laughs> and Oh man, I, I wow. was like 24 years old and was like, yes. Like, and cause they had put out a bunch of cool, like, indie rock there's this band called 90 day men that they did this band called sweep the leg johnny um karate um numero group is re-releasing a bunch of that stuff now but um just great like weird indie weird indie rock you know and, and then me doing like a country folk dark gothic folk thing and so 
Yeah. So that was in 2003. My first record came out. So I did three records with them and they were awesome. They, they were really cool. But that, and then I, I finally ended up getting someone that could kind of book me. I got a booking agent again, this booking agent, he was out of uh, New York city or Philadelphia and then New York city, but he was like a punk rock guy. He was like, I, he's like, I, I book like, um, uh, I mean, all sorts of different stuff, but like, I don't book stuff like you, but I'm willing to take you on. And, and again, it, you it kind of have another, that I, punk rock vibe. I mean, like it, it would, it works, you know, it reminds yeah. me of like, like an against me earlier, like some of their songs in the beginning were kind of faster, like, uh, yeah. not as like heavy. I don't know how to explain it. I don't know if that's oh, but, a great but, reference, but no, like, I, I'm trying to think it's, of it's the perfect <laughs> reference because they, they were burning it up around the same time we were. And they like they they had kind of they already were like doing they were killing it already like reinventing Axl Rose yeah reinventing had just come Axl out. Rose and so we would go down to Florida and see their posters all over and mm-hmm. and I heard it and um and was just like oh they're yeah they're at that time Laura Jane Grace um, yeah um who I just love she she still just kills it she, her her songs are so good but she pioneered a thing that I didn't have words for that. It was like, Oh, okay. Folk punk. Like, that's a thing. Yeah, it was like and a she, folk she punk. like, she helped like, I mean, I, I don't know. People can argue about this, but she helped invent that pretty much. I mean, there, there was, there's people that were on the verge of that and stuff, but she really like brought it to, brought it to the people. So against me was always a big, uh, uh, like, like touchstone, you know, and cause uh-huh. they, they were burning it up right when we were, and then they, they really like took off cause they worked hard and wrote great songs. And, and then I got to tour with them later. Well, because oh, wow. of this booking agent, he would put me on tour with like, um, bands like that, like clutch and converge that there's a band called converge out of Boston. Oh, I love converge too. Jane and, Doe and like, just like, yeah, yeah. That, that, that band is awesome. Just heavier than heavy. Like not like, I don't even know what they do. It's, it's the like, heaviest thing I've ever heard. Like, <laughs> I know. Yeah, and then you Jake rated Bannon. the lyrics and you're like, damn, like this is so good. And you yeah. can't really understand any of it when you're singing. Yep. <laughs> Jake Bannon, man, forever. I love those guys. Yeah, and, he yeah, was wild like on them. stage, climbing, climbs in the rafters and stuff like yeah. nuts. I love watching <laughs> them. Oh, yeah, so fun. I toured with them in in England one time. No but, way, um, that's amazing. So it, it was it was it was awesome, and they're awesome, and and yeah, did a did a tour in Florida with Against Me, and and so yeah, was just swimming in those waters, and had one foot kind of in the more folk world and one foot in that world. And I don't know. I just always liked it like that. It was just always a weird way to do it. And, but yeah, but no, against me is like a perfect touchstone for, for that. And she still writes. And then we were both on bloodshot records at the same time for oh, a couple yeah, of yeah. years ago for a couple of years. And we kind of keep crossing paths every once in a while. Every time I see her, I'm just blown away by what she does. I think she's got a new, she got a new album either out or coming out. Yeah. I don't know. But Laura Jane they, Grace. Yeah. Laura Jane Grace forever. is doing stuff. And then, yeah solo and then with against me i don't know if against me as it they've it's been a while i think since against me put yeah out, yeah her new thing but, is a solo thing yeah but, yeah, but i don't like, know if yeah, she... reinventing the actual rose and eternal cowboy like those and sur- even searching for former clarity the one they did on fat records that song joy that's what it caught your oh, your so songs kind of remember me remind me a little bit of that song joy but yours is oh that's a... just faster you're faster but that's a high compliment like, just kind of, yeah, I don't know. And then that split they did, I really liked too, but I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head. Or it was, maybe it was an EP or seven. I don't know. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Oh, and just so prolific. I mean, they just, yeah. And they, they were really nice to me and just really cool. Again, that community, I don't, I've almost never really had any bad. I mean, maybe I could think hard and find some bad incident or something, but that community in general is really, is pretty loving and accepting. I'm sure there's exceptions to uh, obviously there's, ex- you know, there's fucking assholes and no matter what genre yeah, you're you'll in find, or yeah, you could find one. I'm sure. <laughs> and there are, I know, I know for a fact there are, and, but um, in general, it was just like a cool, loving uh, uh, um, community to have. And, and so it was a, g- a good way to come up and yeah, touring with them was, was really cool. And then yeah, on to different record labels and on and on. And, and you did so a- this, this, a, a, a lot of the earlier albums you did, right? You did kind of like a 
like a concept albums. You did like three albums, right? They were kind of a concept. And then you did another concept album from what I'm remembering, what I read. Yeah, the, those first on those first three records on Southern had a concept, um, it, it, a lot about life and death. I, I had lost my parents like not bef long before that, and so it had a lot to do with that and about um, uh, living well, on the you farm. Were, yeah, you must. Like, have, I mean, you were young when you lost your parents. I'm just, yeah, I was a teenager. Awful. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, and so it was a lot of songs about that, and and you know the cycles of life and death, and. Um, you know, planting in the spring, harvesting in the fall, mm -hmm. uh, just that life, life is all these cycles, right? And people are like that too. We have, we have our, our cycles and, and we're all going to die and that's okay. And, and things, things have a, a lifespan, you know? And so those first three records had a lot to do with that. And then I got to work with um, another dream come true um, and uh, got to be on anti records for a little bit, which is part of Epitaph. Oh and yeah, so I got that, to I got to meet like Brett so Gurowitz and and oh, um, Bad Religion was always a, a always a huge um, influence on me. Like and talking to Brett, I I covered one of their songs for this compilation. I oh, covered yeah, a song yeah. called "Don't Pray on Me." Don't pray on me. I just listened to that because I was going through your your discography and I'm like, is this uh? Because I was looking at that album and I'm like, is this a Bad Religion cover? And then I realized the whole album was a lot of was all covers after a, like, yeah. kind of listening to it. But the the how it started was I checked out that bad religion cover. Yeah, and and so I had they had done a comp like before that that I had done it. So I kind of redid it for this out al that that album. But I had I had been playing it live and stuff. And Brett Gurowitz, I met him at the Epitaph offices a few times. And one time he was like, "Hey, I really like that cover," and it blew my mind. It was like praise from Caesar. It was like right. you are one of my songwriting idols. Like talk about DIY, like starting that label, just that dude has been in the trenches forever. Oh yeah. And, Discovered. You know, so, and, I mean, broke so many bands with that label. They're basically a major, but they're not, you know, yeah, like they're that. like a big, you know, a huge indie. And, yeah. And it, so it was perfect. And so being on you know, anti, which is kind of par part of it, but they do anti does its own thing or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, And so yeah, anti yeah, that, great that, bands. I mean, it, yeah. it, it was really fun they treated me really good too they were awesome and so that first record with them was called animals in the dark and and a lot of people think that is my first record because that was the one that kind of broke through a little bit so yeah that one has before yeah hell and hot or high water that song i had heard quite a bit before uh digging deep into your discography yeah yeah and and so they really got behind me and, and did did me did me really good man they were you they were put awesome, on really, really bigger nice. tours once you or like how you know just was it kind of just notoriety and people like knowing because you know i remember as a kid when if i saw a band that like epitaph put out or fat records or anti then it would be like oh i need to go check out this band because they're on this label which kind of well it has a lot of the time would be a, a you know they signed bands because they're similar to other bands possibly or they'd be kind of in the same vein except for anti is quite, quite different than like an epitaph or fat records but did they help you with more of the like just having the name or was it like you could get bigger tours or just you had been you know established more at that point like what do you think kind of yeah, yeah like with that album or not that album in general it, but just it was being on all that anti yeah. Yeah. It, it was kind of all that. Like I had been, I had been um, doing so much and playing so much that I was, I was really primed. I, I was really ready when they came knock and I was, I was ready, you know, I was like, Oh, I know how, I know exactly how to play shows. I know exactly how to tour. I know, I know how to write songs. And so I, I was ready when they, they came calling. Okay. They called my, they called my uncle. Uh, I, I was living, I didn't have a phone or any electricity. I was living in this cabin. And I didn't oh, have wow. anything and I was just gone most of the time and on tour. And so somehow they got my uncle's number who lived like down the road and he came over on his four wheeler. Oh <laughs> my gosh. That's crazy. Home. I was like, Hey, there's somebody, somebody on the phone from, from Epitaph records. Like, I was like, Oh, <laughs> this like, is a joke. Right. Like, yeah. Right. And like, they left this number. Like, I don't know. I don't even know how they got my uncle's number or whatever, but ended up talking Talk, to them yeah they and, wanted you obviously that to seek you out that far that's amazing 
and it and it went out from there but but they um they just have much more distro as far as like getting the records in stores and getting mm-hmm. getting it in front of people they had much more of that uh the name the name had some cachet and my booking agent who who's he was the same guy i had him for like another 10 years after that and we're still friends wow um, he started um he uh uh started getting me on some pretty cool tours like i was able to tour with the pogues a bunch Wow. Uh, Irish, Irish band. Yeah. Of Pogues yeah, yeah. Um, I got to tour with Chris Cornell. Wow. Uh, from Soundgarden. Yeah. Was and that stuff, his, stuff like, like solo that. when he was doing the solo albums? Yeah. That's this, crazy. That, and that was another, like, cause I, I grew up like loving Soundgarden and all, all that stuff, you know, too. And he was a really cool guy. Um, Chris was a really, really beautiful soul, uh-huh. but uh, st- stuff like that, where I was getting on these bigger tours. And so, yeah, it all, it all sort of culminated and, and helped. And um, yeah, it was, it was just really fun and and they treated me really good. And then, yeah, that kind of, that kind of went away and then, or that, you know, I don't know. I don't think I like sold as many records as they would have liked and stuff. And, and they, but yeah, I happened. love those guys. They were fun. And, yeah. And you did three yeah. albums with them, which is incredible. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. That, that I'm really proud of. Yeah. And so that that first one, that Animals in the Dark record, I was in a political mood because it was it was during the first Bush uh, uh, first well second Bush administration, second Bush second administration of <laughs> George yeah, Bush <laughs> when he got reelected, right? Yeah, like after nine yep. eleven and, all and that, not yeah. not his dad who was the first Bush. This was the right. second Bush second not part H- two part w. two. <laughs> yeah, and so everyone was just pissed off, and it was ripe for like political songwriting and i always liked like billy bragg and and stuff like that that weren't afraid to to speak their mind about certain things so that the animals in the dark in the dark has a lot of that vibe going on Mm -hmm. and then yeah i always try to switch it up with each record try to come up with a new sort of concept it helps me write and come up with stuff if i sort of have some parameters on like it's sort of about this you know and right so the the new one it's called silently the mind breaks and it'll be out in january Mm -hmm. and it it just yeah it has a lot to do with just how your mind can sometimes be your own enemy and like overcoming that and just kind of learning how to find a symbiosis with your own mind you know Mm -hmm. (laughs) which is is, it's it is harder than it seems sometimes like is my mind part of me am i my mind or am I separate from my mind? I think about this stuff all the time. Like, are you, are you your worst thoughts? You know, like, n- right. no, you're not, you know, sometimes you have bad thoughts and you let them go or whatever. And that's not you, you know, you. Uh, yeah. If all, you all act on stuff, them, that's I, a bit I, different, right? <laughs> it, it, <laughs> exactly. The and then, versus acting on the thought. That's you know, yeah. These, these awful dark. Exactly. These awful dark thoughts that you just go, whoa, that was dark. Let that go. <laughs> yeah. We all have them, you know, a hundred percent, just, just weird stuff like that. But, but the mind, as far as a, an entity that you, that you live with and, and deal with and, and kind of wrestling it mm-hmm. and coming to terms with, with these things. And so this new album ha- has a lot to do with that and has a lot to do with everyday people coming up against the wall you know, when you think you can't go anymore, like you think you've, just, especially these last few years, man. And even before that, I mean, for there's always something, but you think you can't go anymore. Like you think you've been pushed to the limit and right. you you're like, keep going, you keep going. Yeah, something. What's next? What's after you, this? And, and, <laughs> and you, you keep going and you like, maybe it's your kids or maybe it's whatever motivation you, you just like, I got to keep going. I got to keep going. And so it's stuff like that too. That, that has a lot to do with this record. And so I'm really proud of it. I think it's some of the best stuff I've written in a long time. And um, I'm putting it out myself. It's the first record. Say, I've yeah, like, this is like a, you're doing a self-release, which I think is awesome. And did you uh, like, how long have you been back living on the, your, your, the farm you grew up on? Has it been a few years or? Yeah. So I moved back here with my wife. Um, yeah. It's been like 11 years ago. Oh, okay. So I didn't know if this was kind of a, okay, I'm back. To where I grew up and that's kind of going through my mind, but I mean, to, we had plenty to, you know, there's plenty of things <laughs> to, that, to draw that on. happened. Yeah. yeah. Within no, the so, last handful of years, but, but, but there's always kind of that too. Like 
man, my heater just kicked on. Is that, do you hear that? No. Is it okay? Cool. I, I don't my, hear it. No. I'm out in my little home studio. My little heater just kicked on. I, didn't I was know gonna say it's was... freezing here. Like I, I can't. If it's snowing there, <laughs> when I went out, I just looked at my watch to see what the weather is. It's 39, but it was like 26 earlier. So right. I can imagine so, yeah, my... it's even colder there. <laughs> so I didn't know if it was distracting on the audio. I could shut it off, but if you can't hear it, that's cool. No, I can't um, hear it at all. And so. So the farm uh, nature themes are always kind of in there too. My dad was like a naturalist and my mom too, like just real appreciators of nature. So I, I write a lot about that in my songs too. But, um, but, but this one, it was really that, that struggle with what do you do with your own mind sometimes? And so, um, yeah, it, it, when it was time to put it out, I was talking to a bunch of different labels and it just, it came around to like, maybe I just want to keep it myself and own the masters. That's a big thing. Owning oh, yeah. your own masters and just putting it out yourself. Mm -hmm. And I've got a, a distro company that's going to help me like get it in stores and that's and awesome. Kind of get it out there and stuff. So it'll, it'll be an experiment, man. But I've, I've talked to people that have done it and said they really, really liked it. And, and maybe you're not getting in front of as many people as you would on, on like an anti, you know, but, but still, I mean, you, you, that... you own it. Yeah, own you it's own it all. You already have uh, a fan base, and you've not. It's not your first rodeo with the album, right? And it's almost like with the internet and the power of that, and social media, and all these different outlets. It's like I feel like well, now nowadays, and yeah, it's yeah. like you don't really need the label to to get. There's the gatekeepers have definitely been. You know, th there's not as many. I guess if you wanted right. to be on pop radio or you know, something like that, maybe the Atlantic name would, would hold a lot more weight. But I mean, if you're doing what you do and you're in the independent thing, and it doesn't matter if you, if you have the numbers and the fans who cares, I mean, you don't need the yeah. other people to do it. No, it, exactly. Like at, at my level and I'm at my little level, like my tiny little level, whatever that is, like it, it totally makes sense. You know, like I don't, I don't need, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not shooting for like trying to play in front of millions of people on the warp tour or whatever. Like, right. Although yeah. That would, that, I mean, That'd that would be, be cool, I, I would sure. take that warp tour. Hit me up. Come on. Uh, no, <laughs> uh, uh, but, uh, but I mean, I just, I like my level. I can, I can play shows anywhere and get a decent crowd and have fun. Like mostly I just want to have fun, connect with people. And now more than ever, thanks to my, my ever loving song, uh, my ever loving bride, my long suffering wife, uh, helps me with a lot of the social media stuff because uh, I'm awesome. super lousy at it. And so she, bless her, she like does so much of that stuff and helps me have an Instagram presence and a, and a Facebook <laughs> presence and all that yeah. stuff. I, awesome. Without that, I don't know what I would do. She really, I can't thank her enough for that. So yeah, you get, you get your hardcore fans and you get the people that like you. And, and when you show up to Cleveland, Ohio at the grog shop, you know, a hundred people are going to come or whatever. Right. Or whatever. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm like, to me, I'm happy with that. Like I, I don't have to answer to anyone. And I, I would, again, I would tell an up and comer like, yeah, go for it like that. And most, I mean, a lot of people are doing that anyway. I mean, like I think of like SoundCloud rappers and stuff. Oh yeah. That like that are millionaires. I'm like, you have one song out. How are you already like a millionaire? And it, you know, it's just having like a great social media presence, sense. having yeah. following, having getting hits and stuff that I have not figured out, but like, or an extreme example, another great example is chance, the rapper mm -hmm. who never, never had a label or anything. And he plays on Saturday night live and he, he does play in, in stadiums. Yeah. And stuff. yeah. Macklemore just, did that too. I think was, just, yeah. they never had to do, he never signed a major or never. And if you're that talented, player. you know, like, it doesn't if matter. You're that talented. You the proof's in the pudding, man. Like, like those guys are they're good. So uh, yeah. but at, at my little level, it makes sense to to uh, just yeah, press the vinyl myself and sell it. And and that's then yeah, cool. and then I've got a company that's gonna help me get it in stores and and all that stuff too, a distro mm -hmm. and all that. But so yeah, it'll be an experiment. Well, well awesome. if I talk to you a year from now, I'll I'll let you know how the experiment went, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, let's do it. We'll set something up for a year from now. I'd love to chat with you about it again. Um, Man, this, you're doing this a tour is awesome. too. You're doing a, a, a tour come, I think, ne February or something. Or yep, it's I'll be touring all next year. 
I'm trying yeah. to, uh, I'm trying to get this going. I'm trying to call it the errors tour <laughs> before someone else takes that. Yeah. So I'm, the, I'm going on the error. Get, get it now. <laughs> the errors tour. Um, oh, errors. Um, I love that. Yes. Yeah. Well, cause I, you know, someone else took the errors tour. I don't know if you, Oh yeah. I thought that, you were making a joke someone else... saying errors tour. I was like, yeah, that's, <laughs> you know, like I want to, oh, yeah. that's going to be my tour. No, someone oh, took but... that. I yeah, forget yeah, her name, but, but errors, someone is on the but that's tour. good. I forget that's her name. Good. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, uh, uh, wow, no, it's, it's stupid, is what it is. But that's but, funny. So I'll be like on tour it. all next year. Um, but not coming to Nashville yet. Stupid, I saw. But... I was like, oh, he's playing Tennessee, and 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 since I'm so new to the to Tennessee, I was like, where's Johnson City? And it's like, oh, it's on the North Carolina border. <laughs> that's about yep. four hours in the opposite direction yep. for me. I think I can yeah, probably I I get was. to Georgia or something quicker than that. Yeah, I, I think I was going to be there. I normally do. Like, I've done, like, the Bluebird and, like, the basement. Oh, yeah. and the, oh and those the, are great um, spots. E the Exit Inn and, uh -huh. and a bunch of other places. But, um, yeah, this, on that run, I won't be. But I, I definitely will be again because my booking agents are out of Nashville. Oh, um, there my you go. My new ones that I've worked with for, like, five years now, they're awesome. And they're out of Nashville, so they're way more in touch with um, the more folk country side of things. Which, mm -hmm. as I get older, that's more uh, less less punk rock venues, more um, uh, you know other type of venues. I mean, I'll, I'll still play anywhere. I'll play wherever. <laughs> anywhere, but, but these sure. guys, they're, they're cool. But they're out of Nashville, so I'll definitely be there awesome. sometime. But yeah, starting in February, I'll be hitting the road, and then all year long, I'll be touring. And um, yeah, it's gonna be fun, man. I'm. I'm I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. I, I'm not oh, really no, a person anyone, anyone knows. I'm not really like that much you of a known a, quantity, man. But well, you have a fascinating those, story and and I love your music and that's that's all that matters. Um well, and I appreciate, I appreciate your time. Thank and I actually you've answered my que my final question a couple of times throughout this interview, but I'm just gonna ask you again, because I wanna know if you have you said, you know, I would say this to an up and comer, but do you have any, yeah, do you have any additional advice to uh, any aspiring artist? Yeah. Um, I, I love this because I always gleaned information from, you know, like other artists I was on tour with, like bigger artists that have been at it for a while. I would like soak it up and get, get advice and get thoughts. And, and no one's going to have the exact wisdom that you need. Like you have to, you have to get it from a lot of different places to, to suit mm -hmm. your, you know, my, my experience won't be the same as a kid's now coming up at all. But there's certain truisms that'll just always be the case. One of them is try to keep your, if you're going to tour, like if, if touring is something you want to do and playing shows, even if it just starts with playing shows in your hometown and then maybe get into the town that's two hours away. And then maybe from there getting, you know, just not grand touring ambitions, but just little ambitions like that. If you're going to do that, keep your overhead low, meaning you don't have to spend a ton of money to tour, like try to get a network of people that like, maybe you can stay with friends, stay with people. Like instead of getting a hotel room, you don't need a big giant tour bus. Like try to do with like a small van. If you're, a, if you're a band, like just like keep your overhead low. I mean, Mike Watt put it the best, like jam and econo. He, he called it the minute men, like we jam econo and, I, and don't, don't spend a ton of money. That way you can come home with a little bit of money and and put that toward the next thing but keep your overhead low like you don't people's people's eyes start getting too big for their stomach and they think they need a lot of fancy stuff and and tour buses and all that and like you don't need that yet just just get on the road get in front of people be wise with your money that's one thing that's something that'll always be true um take you know get advice wherever you can of course now it's easier than ever there's there's a lot more of a playbook for it now Mm -hmm. But um, I would say that I would say, yeah, get your community in place. And again, that's easier than ever on the Internet. You get your community going. You could probably show up in a town and have already have a crowd if they if they know your sound, if they know your band camp, if they mm -hmm. know your SoundCloud, whatever. You maybe never played in that town, but you could already have a crowd there, you know. So that's that's easier now more than ever. But get your get your community going not just fans but like fellow musicians whatever type of music you do um yeah look uh, make friends you know tr make friends with other people that kind of do that and then maybe you get on tour together like hey maybe we could hit up a tour together and like even do more like 
And, and I always say like community, uh, uh, be smart with your money <laughs> and also just have fun, have fun. Fuck it. Like what, you know, yeah. have fun and make music too. Like that, let us not forget <laughs> you're making music cause you love it. Like, and if it's your ambition to make it your living, that's one thing. If it's just your ambition to like play on the weekends and have fun, make that your thing, whatever, like whatever it is, but have fun, write good songs. That's the other thing. Write good, write good songs. <laughs> uh, and so, but no, but all jokes aside, like, yeah, if, if touring is your ambition and making a living at it, be smart with your money. Uh, uh, have a lawyer look at anything you sign. That's another one. Right, yeah. <laughs> I, that's things that sometimes I didn't always do that. And like, um, you know, a lot of legalese and contracts can be very complicated. So have a lawyer look at it. It seems it might even cost you a little money, but it'll cost you later down the road more if you don't, if you just sign stuff. Um, so yeah, that, that uh, stuff like that, common sense, stuff like that, but, but mostly have fun, play music. Bring